that song. I don't know how old that song is, but it is a classic. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and get into it here and uh, pick up where we left off. This is the uh, third, uh, I think, pass at trying to wrap up this uh, racial fetishist topic. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, get Lee on the phone and see how we do. I got a good feeling that we might wrap it up this time. So let's see. Hey. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. How about you? I'm good. Um, sorry for rushing there. No, no worries. I know. I'm um uh, I'm an irresponsible human being, so <laughs> I, you're you're a horrid person. I'm just a terrible, <laughs> terrible person. I've never been ten minutes late to anything in my life. You no. should be ashamed of yourself. No. <laughs> So yeah, you know we're we're live on the podcast. Let me tell you what I just did though, um, and I, I love talking about this stuff on the air. Everybody's well, not everybody, but some people are like, "You're just really candid on the podcast." I'm like, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Who am I trying to impress? <laughs> I don't care. So I opened up the episode with the playlist shuffle. You know how I usually play a song at the beginning? Oh no, yes. So I just opened it up with the playlist shuffle, and uh, nice track came on. You'll hear it when you when you go back and listen to it. It's a song by Usher, so it was you know it was real, it was real safe. You know, it was nothing crazy. <laughs> real safe. But I, I figured that'd be a way to kind of compress the time and uh, kind of jump into it. Yeah, that's awesome because yeah. we've got a lot to cover today to try to wrap up part three. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I was like, this is our third pass at trying to well, yeah. trying to kill this thing. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, not kill, but, you know, knock out this topic. Yes. But, I mean, yes. I think it's, it's – I don't think it's going to be like – eating a fast food meal like i'm saying this is a I know. this is a this is a like a what, three four course meal we're trying to <laughs> consume here racial fetishes part 643 you know <laughs> yeah like five years from now we're still on fetishes racial fetishes <laughs> i'm like there's a lot everyone's to, favorite topic yeah there's a lot to unpack here and i don't think you can do it you know in 10 minutes um <laughs> All right, so before we jump into it, how are you doing? Yes. Doing well. Yeah, doing well. Yeah. Um, it's been kind of a – I purposely kind of kept this weekend pretty chill. It's been super busy, and especially before we, we record, it's not like – it's not good if I have too much going on. You know, I kind of need to, like, clear my mind and try to get my mind focused on what we're doing, have some time to, like – I don't know, just get my mind in that, in that frame set or that, um, frame of mind, you know, that mindset. So, yeah. So I kept it pretty chill and just trying to catch up on stuff around the house and do all that kind of, you know, rest. I slept in today. That was super nice. Oh yeah. People with kids do not want to know how many hours of sleep I got last night. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kind of obscene. (laughs) It's one of the reasons I was kind of stabbed me. Yeah. It's kind of one of the reasons I was rushing here because wife was out running errands I'm with my son here, and I fell asleep on the couch, and I woke up like at one like thirty, and I was like, "Oh shit!" Like <laughs> I got to record in like thirty minutes. Right, right, and right, right. My wife's not here. I'm like, hey, that's when you got that text. I was like, hey, you back yet? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I figured that was probably meant for her. Yeah. Like, hey, because I got to get him cleaned up and changed to pass him off. So you know, whatever. Yeah, so I yeah. do hate you for the sleep you got, probably. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you how, how long I slept last night, but I'm feeling pretty refreshed. <laughs> so, I, I got to ask you, before we jump into it, did you see any of the uh, Cohen uh, hearing? I saw a couple of clips. I didn't watch the whole thing by any means, but I did see some of the the kind of, you know, most salient clips that came out of it. So, yeah. So, yeah, Super I have interesting. I got to ask you about the, the one I sent you. Did you see Congressman uh, Mark Meadows? He was the one who brought up uh, Lynn Patton. She's the black woman that works for Trump. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I watched the clip that you sent me, and then I saw, you know, some articles. I didn't really read a ton of them, but, yeah, about them bringing her on as kind of, like, proof, right? That, yeah. 
that Trump's not racist? Is that what they were trying that's, to that's do? That's exactly what it was. And I was like, yeah. I just, I got to talk about this briefly and we won't get too far into it, but it just speaks to um, that point you made about how can a sexist man marry a woman? Right. You know? Right. And it was playing out like right in front of our eyes. So, right. I think uh, uh, Cohen had said, you know, that tr- he called Trump a racist, obviously. And so Mark Meadows brings up this black woman, you know, and he's like, oh for those gosh. of you who didn't see it, and he didn't say it, but this is what he, he did something like, uh, hey, that's Cohen. That's what he was implying. It was crazy. He's like, hey, so do you know this, this woman, Cohen? And he's like, yeah. He's like, I'm responsible for her being hired. Uh, in the Trump organization, and he was like, well, you know, Mark Meadows says, you've made some pretty startling accusations, and, you know, she works for, for Trump, and she she disagrees with you. So he did everything but say, here's a black woman that works for Trump. <sighs> I can't, I hate when white people do that. Like, and it okay. happens all the time, and every time they do it, it's like their attitude is like, they are just playing their their biggest card that you can't argue with and that no one else in the history of ever has ever done this before. Like, and I'm here as a person of color, like y'all try to do this shit all the time, but you think you're so brilliant. Yeah. Like, and what's so what crazy about it, besides the obvious, is um, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, I'm not sure how to say her last name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pause if I'm, I'm mispronouncing it. And she said, well, I'm offended by what you just did. Right, totally you know, called it out. Calls him out on his bullshit. Yeah, he and then she gets like kind of lamb blasted. She got blasted, and, yeah. and he was just like Mark Meadows is like I'm now offended. He's like, oh, oh, oh how could you? <laughs> I think what you just did to me is racist. It's racist, right? I'm Another like, what? I'm like, I move. can't believe this is happening, right? Yeah. And so yeah, Elijah yeah. Cummings, who's in charge of the whole thing. That was the black man, right? Yeah, who yeah. marched with um, uh, Martin Luther King, who was on the Selma Bridge, and but then he goes to bat for the white guy. I don't now, so I I I don't want to come down hard on him yet because I don't understand why he did that. I don't because he called Mark Meadows his friend, and right. I'm like, it's kind of hard for me to to connect those dots. Like, how are you a friend with a man who does this? Yeah, knowing and doing what you've done. I don't know right. if it's strategy. I don't know if it's genuine right, friendship. Right, like internal politics type thing. Yeah, because I part of my brain is like he's got it's got to be strategy. Because how could he? How can you be friends with somebody who blatantly disrespects you like that? Right. Um, yeah. It looked bad though to me for him to kind of go back at Rashida, Congressman Rashida right. uh, Talib. Like, can you explain yourself? And I was telling my wife, I'm not rambling here. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I was telling my wife, I was like, I think the perfect way to combat that accusation would be to say, I'm not calling you racist. What I'm saying is, this is how it made me feel. That right. made me feel like that was a racist thing to do. And I, I don't know that you can combat how a person feels. Right. And I think or, that she she could have made a strong point with that, but she didn't. She kind of tried, but. Well, she kind of did. I mean, I felt like, I mean, it's been a couple of days ago that I watched that, but I feel like she tried to differentiate between um, I called him a racist versus I'm calling his behavior racist action. Yeah. Right? Isn't that kind of the I think it was kind of what she was took? trying to do. I just would have Which, loved it, you know, if she would have been like, okay, I'm not calling you racist, but this, that felt racist to me. Right. And that really bothered me what you just did. But I don't know that if that was setting, your intention. Right. But that's but how that it made setting, me feel. Yeah. Are they really going to respect, like, this is how that made me feel? Like, is that language that they would really respect in that setting? Probably you know not. what I'm saying? No. Um, but, I just think that could have been a really good angle for her to drill right. hard. Right. And I don't just don't know how you combat that. You can't combat. I mean, you can, but I just don't think it looks intelligent if you're combating somebody's feelings. Well, but people do that all the time. Oh, of course I they mean, do. And I yeah. think they look stupid when they do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they like, you're going to tell me how though. I feel? 
<laughs> they don't think they look stupid though, because then they just say, "Well, I feel like you're a reverse racist," you know, like, or I feel like what you said was racist. And, and then you, you know, respond then with, "You're an like, idiot." No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then you win. <laughs> No, but, to, but to your point of like bringing out this like one black woman, you know, to try to prove something. I mean, we've talked about this before. It's like the whole, well, I date people of color or I adopted, you know, black kids or a Chinese girl or whatever. And like people try to pull out all these things to prove. Like I always say to people, the only thing that proves you're not racist is not being racist. There you go. Like in your behavior. Like, I don't want to know who you dated. I don't want to know who your best friends are. I don't want to know who you adopted. I don't want to know who you had sex with. Like, I don't care. Yeah. Like, the only thing that proves to me that you're not racist is literally in your behavior and in your words, not being racist. So all these other things that people try to use to prove something, like, they really don't mean anything but 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 we see like you see why folks doing that or i do like all the time yeah. right or they'll they'll post um who's that sheriff sheriff um clark oh, is the, that the black dude yeah i the can't black stand dude. that guy like I, I mean this used to happen all the damn time and every time i just wanted to laugh because i could tell the way these white folks were were arguing with me they think that this is like, ooh, like, gotcha now. Like, no one's ever, like, I haven't ever seen this little trick before when really this is like, you're the, you know, 563rd person who's tried to like post a video of some person of color parroting your opinions as if that proves that they're right because you found one black person that, that agrees with your, you know what I'm saying with your yeah, views? Like, I, okay, what does that prove to me? Nothing. That's the weakest like, argument to me. Black, no group of people is is monolithic. Like no group of people all believes the same way or the same thing, you know. And so just because like you found this one person like that that agrees with you who is black, I'm just like, OK. And like, how does that? I, I, OK, like but next. Like, how does that prove yeah, it's, anything? It's but not it's intelligent. Like, but they think that that's like, wham, like that's their, their like they're you know if you're playing a game of cards like oh you just revealed your hand that you have this winning hand that that's their big you know like trump card so to speak and it's just like oh it's just it's tiring so yeah i mean seeing that like play out on you know national like television yeah. is just i don't know i mean but but that plays out in mi micro levels you know all the time too just like in everyday um interactions and i actually saw someone post on facebook the other day something about like to all my white friends like do not use me as your token you know black friend to like try to prove that you're not that you're not racist like don't use me in that way like i don't want to be used oh, like that, that is that like that'd be awesome if that's like a new hashtag <laughs> if, if what's i'm not hashtag? i'm not your token black person <laughs> right and I think that, you know, it, like I think back to my earlier years that I shared about, like in Southern Indiana, like I've never heard anyone. I, I never knew of anyone who used me personally in that way. Mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of what got disrupted when I started being so vocally anti-racist is like and coming and arguing with them and pushing back against their viewpoints. You know, I think they viewed me in that way. Like, Oh, I'm, I'm this, you know, person that ha I have friends of like other internally. Races. Yeah. Like, like I'm okay never because that, yeah. or maybe they did. I don't know. Right. Then nobody ever said it to my face, Yeah, but, but it's like, but now all of a sudden I'm making it clear, not that I was like trying to do that, but it's just becoming clear that no, actually we're not on the same page at all. Yeah. We've just never talked about these things. Yeah. Right. And I think that's often the case in relationships between, you know, white folks and people of color. Like, yeah, you can have this surface level friendship um, or even deeper than that. But in the area of like race and racism, like, have you guys really have you talked about those things? And does that person of color even feel safe enough around you that they're being honest with you, that they feel like they can be honest about 
their experiences or how they feel. So a lot of times, I guess the point I'm trying to make is a lot of times in like interracial friendships, I think, you know, the white folks think everything's all good. And yeah, this is my BFF or these are my close friends of color. But, um, you know, the person of color may not, may not feel that way. Maybe they do, but maybe they don't actually feel that level of comfort and intimacy, or maybe they don't feel like, like I said, they can be totally honest with that person because that person yeah. is not going to get it. So anyways, yeah, it's just interesting that whole like token person of color. I mean, it's gross. It's, yeah. it's more than interesting. It's gross. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and not to take it any further, um, but just a note real quick, the people of color that side with racists, I'll never understand that. Like I get it and I can see how it happens, but it just, it all, every time, like it just always mind boggles me. Like, how is that happening? And then for people who don't understand that, I could, I don't know, look up uncle Tom. Look, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like it's just a self hate. I don't know what that is. I can't relate to it. So I mean, I think it's, it's people, we've talked about how deep the messages of white supremacy and run in society. And I think, you know, we've talked about how we as people of color are susceptible to internalizing that too, just yeah. because we're people of color doesn't mean we automatically don't ingest any of that. You know, we, we can, and we do. And I think some people ingest a lot more of that than others and yeah. just don't realize it. Cause those messages are powerful. I mean, they really are very powerful and, and they've been around for hundreds of years and they're in media and in education and in our history books. I mean, it, they're in so many areas that, you know, um, yeah, I think sometimes people just, they, they ingest that and don't even realize that that's what's happening, Yeah, you know? Um, quick example, and then we can, we can get on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just the, something I saw this morning that was just real subtle, but just kind of in your face. And I had to turn it off. I was watching Netflix with my son and, uh, there was a cartoon on that that we were watching. It was called Kong King of the Apes and the two heroes. Have you seen it? No. Oh, okay. And the two heroes were these two white kids with blonde hair. Yeah. Okay. And they had a maid and she was Hispanic. And the bad guys had darker skin. They weren't black, but they had darker skin and darker hair. Right. And I was like, nope. <laughs> I turned it off. <laughs> right? I'm like, not going not gonna to feed him those messages. Exactly. And your, your, your son is what, two? Yeah, he's two. Yeah. Right. And so, like, when, when if you didn't have that awareness as a parent, right, to recognize that and recognize what he could – that he would start internal the the messages that he would start internalizing from yeah. that. You know what I'm saying? That that's it's it is. It's, it's in foul. so white supremacy <laughs> is in yeah, but it's in so many different areas. Um yeah, yeah. It, it's powerful. And the thing that's crazy <laughs> about it is I don't know if it's intentional or not. You know, because like if, if I was like if that was my TV show, I'm gonna make I'm gonna portray people that look like me. And so, like, if it's white people, I wonder if they're doing it on purpose or they're just doing it because they want to reflect people who look like them. I don't know. But, but either way, it's wrong. Right. Either th- This is a phrase, I, another phrase I learned in grad school that was so huge for me. It's just this little, almost like a little equation, but it's, it is impact, the word impact, and then the greater than sign. Mm-hmm. And then the word intent. So impact is greater than intent. And so, you know, that's basically just saying um, I like that, that at the end of the day, right? Like it, I mean, it does matter what your intentions are. Intentions matter. They mm-hmm. do. But at the end of the day, even if your intentions are good, you can still have a super negative or racist impact. Yeah. Right. And, and that's like. I think probably where that phrase came out of is that's one of the ways that white folks always want to excuse racism, right? When, when other, when white folks have, have rate, say something racist or it's like, well, I didn't mean for that. You know, that, that wasn't my intention. I didn't mean it that way. Well, we all do lots of things that we don't, 
intend for it to have a negative impact. But as an adult, or and even even as a child, but especially as adults, right? Like there's a there's a time where it doesn't really matter whether you intended this to be harmful or not. If it was harmful, you have to like take responsibility for those actions. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel like in that case it's like at the end of the day, yeah, did they mean to like set up this white supremacist uh, um or like white people are the good guys and then here's all these people in inferior or evil positions that are the bad guys or the maids or whatever. You know, it's like at the end of the day like that's what you did and you know what I'm saying? Yeah, How I is that you. impacting people? So, yeah. anyways. Okay. So, uh, I just think those are some really, you know, powerful examples of what we've been talking about. Um, for those of you who are listening that may need an example or want one. Okay. So, okay. Racial fetishes. What do you got? Okay. <laughs> Hit me. Okay. Okay. So, um, where do we leave yeah, off? So, um, I can't remember what exactly what our last like yeah. topic was, but I kind of know where to pick where I think I want to pick up on. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, I think we talked about this last time, but again, we're not pathologizing interracial relationships, right? Right. That disclaimer, we're just trying to like dig into some of the factors because of the society that we live in and the hist- the racial history of this country. We're trying to dig into some of the factors that can be a part of, um, or can be issues in interracial relationships. Right. So um, I kind of wanted to start out with, um, yeah, kind of talking about some of the problems and we maybe have hit on some of these things, but some, but maybe just lay it out a little more succinctly. Some of the uh, like problematic <laughs> um, places that, that both white folks or people of color can be coming from um, when they are in, Inter or, or pursuing like an interracial relationship. Again, this is not all. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe talk about some sexual stereotypes because we haven't really gotten there yet, and we can't really talk about racial fetishes without bringing up sexual stereotypes. So, right. um, I I know some of I know some people, some of my friends, anyways. Like they have some of their kids listen in on some of these podcasts. So you know, this one might be a little more like ah oh, warning rated. <laughs> PG or rated R when we get to that part. So just wanted to kind of throw that part out there too. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, for, let's start out with white folks that are in interracial relationships. Um, some of those um, ways that maybe they can be coming from um, uh like approaching these relationships in some problematic ways are I think some white folks at times um, want to date folks of color to kind of like prove they're not racist. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think um, as white folks start to understand the history of this country and the history um, of what white folks have perpetuated, sometimes there's like guilt that comes with that. And instead of like working through that guilt in healthy ways, I think sometimes, you know, there is this like, well, this will prove, I mean, what what we were talking about earlier, right? Well, if I'm dating someone who's a person of color or this or that, that kind of is like this proof that I'm not like the other white people or the bad white people. Right. Right. Um, So I think that can be one thing. I think um, something one of my friends mentioned that she's seen a lot is Uh, You know, maybe they recognize that their parents are racist or their dad's racist and they kind of want to like rebel. It's kind of part of a rebellion phase, right? Like rebelling against their parents or rebelling against their dad that, well, you know, you say I can't date a black man. Well, I'm going to go date a black man kind of thing. Um, So, that yeah, that's another thing. Um, Shameless plug. That's kind of the... um narrative of the uh, little short that film that we're that we're filming that you helped me on oh yeah 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 that plays into it really yeah i don't remember that coming in the script yeah it may not have been something we directly talked about but um it's one of those subtle messages i didn't want to make it overt okay kind of a subconscious thing maybe yeah she's doing okay 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I think another thing I've seen a lot, and this is like especially grosses me out, is like people who fet. I guess as a mixed race person, <laughs> really grosses me out is people that like fetishize mixed kids, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh, I want a mixed baby, or they're so pretty. Um, yeah, they're so exotic and they're so cute, and they're like this just mix. You just don't know what mix you're going to get. And you know, it's like, um, like I have joined, there's a lot of like mixed race groups on Facebook and I joined some of them trying to, trying just to understand myself better as a mixed race person and find a little bit of community. Um, but even in a lot of those groups, a lot of times the parents, it was just like the parents who were the ones in these like interracial relationships posting all these like weird fetishy pictures of their kids. And I'm not saying, I mean, I think it's great when, when parents gush over, you know, their kids and think their children are like the cutest things that have ever walked the face of the earth. Right. That's, that's a normal loving parental thing to do, Mm -hmm. but just some of the ways these children being were being talked about in these groups was just really funky to me. And so anyways, I got out of those groups and then there's others that have been really awesome. What were they they saying? What were they doing? You know, it's been a while. I wasn't in the groups long Mm -hmm. before I kind of picked up on that. It's hard for me to remember Were they saying things like all their hair is so whatever uh yeah curly or the texture yeah i think like i said it's hard for me to remember exact things that were being said but all of it just had this weird like exoticizing feel to it or people just like oh so that's what a kid who's this this and this looks like you know just like this weird I, i don't know curiosity yeah. I guess, or, or like fascination or I don't know quite how to explain it, but it, it just felt really funky. The impact versus me. the intent. <laughs> right. And kind of, kind of like that, your quick, your quick, quick learn <laughs> there, Matt. Uh, but but uh, just kind of that exoticizing factor. Like it, I, I feel like anytime people are made out to be these, um, exotic creatures that's a way of objectifying them Mm -hmm. right like dehumanizing them and making them more into objects rather than like human beings and so that anytime i see that no matter what situation that's in you know that is always just a huge like red flag turn off to me um but another place like where i would see this like fetishizing children children of color not always even mixed children Um, was way back in the day, like when I was 20, I think I worked at Target for a brief period of time. And um, this was in Southern Indiana where we had, I think like half, half a percent of our population was Asian, right? So not a lot of Asian folks. Mm -hmm. And then a portion of those, of that half of a percent were adopted, um, you know, little Asian Chinese girls adopted by probably upper middle class white families. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I would be, so I was like a cashier or whatever at target. And uh, so we would have these, you know, like these white moms come through the line with their adopted Chinese daughter. And it's like these other, you know, my, my colleagues, these other employees or just people that were around in line like the comments they would make about these girls, these babies, would it just made me want to throw up. They'd be like, I mean, it would start out maybe more innocent, right? Like, oh my gosh, she's so cute. Um, she's adorable. You know, just how people gush over babies. Mm-hmm. But then, like I remember one time someone said, I want one. Mm. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Right. Like as if these children are just like these objects that you can go, you know, to the store and just pick out the the race that you think is cute or you know what I'm saying? It just yeah. like was super funky. Um, and so I and it kind of had that feel of like, oh, the little China doll. 
you know, which is objectifying Mm -hmm. us, right? We're not dolls. We are human beings. We're individuals with different thoughts and emotions and experiences, you know? And so, um, that, so I think one time I, I mean, I couldn't say this like in front of everyone because I didn't want to get fired, but I remember one time I, um, after that happened, I was like, I was like, you know, the next time I see a white baby, I'm going to be like, oh, look at the little white baby. Like, I want one, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's like turning the tables. People don't realize some, I think, often how what they're saying is so strange and weird and problematic until you flip it around. And then it hits them like, what what do you mean you want one? You know what I'm saying? And so anyways, um, so there's that. Um, I think. Another thing with white folks sometimes is what we've already mentioned like five times, right? Like wanting to date someone, a person of color because it's exotic well, or they see that person as exotic. Can you hang on to that for a second? Because I, I don't want to just skip past what you just said. I thought I okay, think that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's real. It's real. You, that happens so frequently, that kind of thing where you're saying, hey, I want one. It may not be those exact right. words or, you know, that exact situation. But it's one of those things. I'm glad you said that impact versus intent thing. I've I've never heard it put that way. Um, Because I've heard so many times from from white people uh, where they'll say, well, I didn't mean, you know. Right. That that wasn't my, I wasn't. And sometimes I think they're telling the truth. Right. I I, I didn't mean to do that. No, I agree. you're, You're coming from your position of privilege and you don't recognize these things because you haven't had to deal with them. Right. And so... Um, I don't know how you handle that situation, you know, um, because if you were to bring it up, I can only imagine it would be like what Mark Meadows did. They're going to be so offended and hurt right. by you pointing it out that they're going to try to defend themselves. Yeah. You know? And I mean, I, I think defensiveness is often a human, you know, just like a go to. Yeah. Like I still get defensive sometimes about things that I shouldn't. You yeah. know, so I think it's very easy as human beings and especially in the area of racism for people to get defensive. But I think even in the moment when folks get defensive about being called out about something and that's like super frustrating and it's super taxing as a person of color. But I still I think my hope is that maybe they'll chew on it and maybe down the road, maybe even if they can't admit right now. Yeah. That, that what they did or said is a problem, you know, maybe down the road, um, you know, maybe they'll think about it and maybe they'll admi- they'll be able to admit to themselves <laughs> like, oh, that was kind of funky. Maybe I shouldn't or racist and I, maybe I shouldn't say yeah. that again or maybe I should think about this, you know. And I wonder again if saying something to the effect of that's that made me feel as a person of color, that made me feel this kind of way. I, I wonder if that has any weight or value with them. Um, because I, I don't know how you defend, I don't, I don't know how you attack that. I know you do. I know people do it all the time. We, we, we mentioned that, but I, I just, for some reason I keep sticking to that in my head because I feel like I can defend against it. If you're attacking me, I'm like, you can't, you can, I never tried to tell you how you feel about anything. So why are you trying to tell me how I feel? Yeah. But, but you're coming from the perspective mm-hmm. of like, a respectful person who's thinking (laughs) rationally about these issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of times in conversations around racism, people aren't necessarily thinking rationally because they're thinking from that place of privilege, which, which automatically gives you um, blinders, you know? Um, So, I get what you're saying, but mm-hmm. unfortunately, in my experience, that's not how it plays out. Like, oh, I feel like, not, in, no. you know, in all like all the conversations I've had around racism, I mean, believe me, I've tried like everything, all different kinds of approaches. Right. Like, oh, well, that's not working. OK, let me try this. Oh, no, that's not working. Let me try this. And I think I don't know. My conclusion at the end of the day is it doesn't it's not really about us and how we're communicating something right at the end of the day. It's not about that person of color and, and the way they're breaking something down or the tone or the, I feel, or it makes me feel it it really, it doesn't really have much to do with us. And it has 
almost everything to do with that other person. Mm -hmm. Right. And whether they are in a place where they want to hear perspectives that are different from theirs or like their, their level of open-mindedness or their level of recognizing their privilege and that there are legitimate other experiences that they aren't familiar with, because if they're not open to that, then you can say it how, you know, you've dealt with this. You can say it however you want to say it. And it doesn't matter. It's just going to like ping right off of them. And I'm not saying like, our approach or how we handle things doesn't matter. I'm not saying that, but I am saying with certain folks, you know, like I, it, I, I do think it doesn't matter because it's not really about how we're communicating. Does that make sense? It does. And, and let me say this, cause I I'm assuming this, and this is just kind of in my head here. Um, some of you listening to, that don't know, I, I'm, I'm in an interracial marriage. <laughs> I, I don't, if you haven't been following the podcast, you wouldn't know that. Um, so yeah, I'm in an interracial marriage. My wife is for lack of a better word, white. Um, and we never really talked about it. I hate saying that. Um, I would like to reference, you know, her actual background, like she's Irish and some other things, I I believe. And Amy, I'm sorry if that's not correct. You've told me, I just don't retain it. (laughs) (laughs) Wait a minute. (laughs) Super important, but you don't remember. Yeah, it's, it's it's one of those things like you know, it's 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 not the topic more so than it's me, um, just the kind of person I am in my marriage with my wife, where she tells me things and it goes out in one ear and out the other. Hey, I told you to do this thing. This that. It, that it's on me. It's on me. <laughs> you just admitted that, and thousands of women across the U.S. were like. A man admitted. <laughs> yeah, it, it's on me. It, that, that is my fault. Um, but it's 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 for other reasons where I, I I like her, not what she is or the color of her skin. I like her as a person, as a human being, and that's a whole other conversation. Um, but bringing that up for the obvious reason, I am in a in a in a racial marriage. Um, but I've had conversations with her where I've had to do what we just talked about where I had to say, this is how this makes me feel. Right. What if, and putting the shoe on her, you know, on the other foot, right. Pain right. the situation for her. Then she has to step back and, and think about it and be receptive. And we had a lot of fights early on about things where, you know, she may have said something to the effect that, you know, is it really that bad or are you exaggerating? Sure. You know, sure. and sure. Um, she's completely open to talk about this. So I'm not like putting her on blast right now, by the way. I don't want to get like hate messages from people. Oh, you mother, you. No, she she's very vocal and open about it, and so. Yeah. Um, but she was receptive, um, right? Because she's obviously in it for the long haul. <laughs> she's sure. with a black man, so. Right, right, um, right. So, but she was receptive, and I was I had to do that thing to her, and it worked. And um, I don't want to name any other names, but other people and friends I've had, um. I have had productive conversations with them about race by using that tactic. Sure. Um, but they, again, I have to admit, for whatever reason, are receptive to me. Sure. You know, yeah. where they say, I've even had them say, <laughs> Matt, you're different. And I say, no, I'm not. You just know me. Right. Right. And even saying stuff like that, I, I've always been able to. When, it, when it's been effective, I've been able to, to make progress by um, not so much, I don't want to say attacking them, but just taking a more chill approach to the situation. Because sure. a lot of these conversations end up in heated debates. Right. And it, it's unfortunate, but I, I, from my experience, and I won't only speak for myself, I've been effective with it when I've had to take, uh, what's the word? Um uh, just a more chill <laughs> or kind of mature approach to it and have to be the bigger person and take some punches and you know, have thick skin and able to get my point across. Sure. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I definitely, um, I think, I say that because I, I, for those of you who might be listening who are, who are black, I don't, or I, I, I do think there's ways to have these conversations. And I, I don't know, you know, 
all the ways to do it, but I do think that is one of the ways to potentially tackle that topic, you know, with, um, with white people or even people who aren't. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> and I'm, I, I don't disagree with you. Mm. I, I think I'm just thinking, I'm just trying to say that nothing is guaranteed. And I think the examples I was thinking of about conversations with folks was more so people I don't know Strangers. or don't know very well. Yeah. And I think a lot of times in those cases, yeah. yeah, like they don't know you and, um, but yeah, I mean, I have also navigated these issues very successfully with a lot of white folks too, but that tends to be like face to face people that I know better or that they just have a level of respect kind of coming into the conversation. Yeah. I, I just don't want um, to because, there's like no hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I think I think knowing someone personally can eat in com- and around subjects like this can, in my experience, go one of two directions. Either it goes a lot better because they know you and they trust you and there's already that foundation. Or in some cases, it can go a lot worse because like I get this a lot. And I think part of this is gendered as well. Like me being a woman, mm-hmm. it's like, well, we know you and you don't know anything that we don't know, you know, kind of like I'm too familiar to them. Yeah. And these aren't necessarily people I know super well, but I think sometimes it can go that direction. Like, Oh, you're just, you're just Leah. Like we don't care what you know. It's nothing that we don't know. Like you can't teach me anything kind yeah, of thing. That's, Almost that's like a, too much of a familiarity where they just dismiss you. Or I think you brought, brought up a good point of, you know, people saying, um, I think this is where you were going with this, like trying to make you out when you said people would say to you, well, you're just different. They were trying to say you're just different than other black folks. Right. Exactly. Is that what they were getting at? Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that's kind of what um, was destroyed a little, uh, probably a lot when, you know, I think that's how a lot of white folks in my life when I lived in Indiana looked at me. Right. Like we'll accept you and you're cool as long as you are the one who does the assimilating and you're not like all those other angry people of color who talk about racism all the time. But when I did start to talk about racism, it just kind of I wasn't the exception anymore. Right. And and no, again, no one ever said this to my face, but I think in their mind I was somehow an exception, like one of the good people of color, which that really meant I don't make things uncomfortable for them and I don't call out their racism. And when I started to do that, I think then they easily threw me into, I I think that's why there was that lack of respect in conversations, right? Like I went from being the exception (laughs) to now you're like all the other people of color. Yeah. Yeah. And And that's not who they wanted. They wanted a, a docile you know, comfortable person of color, the tokenized, right, person of color in their life. Yeah. And let me be clear, like, we shouldn't <clears throat> have to do that. I, I, Assimilate? Yeah, like, um, yeah. or we shouldn't have to have, I shouldn't have to have those conversations. Like, it, it should, the onus shouldn't be on me to, you know, get my 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 teachable point across. Um, right. I don't want to, so I don't, cause I've had people get on me for that. Like, no, I don't, we shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's, we're not obligated. We're not obligated to, to teach do that. anything exactly, or to do it in a certain way. That's a choice that each of us has to make. And I, I've made the choices I've made. It should be on them to learn. Right. In, in my opinion. Um, right. So I, I just want to make that clear um, that we, we don't have to do that. <laughs> right. And I think we, Two, we don't have to do it in any certain way. It doesn't have to be super gentle and kind no, because it that doesn't. gets into um, like respectability politics and, and tone policing, which we need to cover that on another topic. But just, you know, where we're required to deliver our message in a certain kind of way. Yeah. Right. No. Like it, it, my if I feel angry about racism, I'm entitled to feel angry about that and to express that anger. And, and you yes, have I'm the right to do that. <laughs> I have to be, you know, res- like aware of, you know, I mean, I, I can't just go like 
commit, you know, like <laughs> kill some folks, you know what I mean? Like, obviously like I have to be responsible in the way that I express that anger. But I think often what white folks consider an okay way to express anger. Well, I think often there isn't one right to, uh, there isn't a right way to express anger about racism. You should never, exp- you know, like yeah. that's, Often for white folks, it's don't, don't express anger at all. And that's not, I mean, racism is abuse. And, uh, you know, we have, we have every right to express our anger over living in an abusive society and be as angry as we, we, we need to be about that. And we don't have to, you know, coddle white people's feelings and, 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 like jump through hoops to make it comfortable for them. It's not comfortable. Like it is not comfortable and that is not a requirement. And in fact, if it is comfortable, there's probably not that much good that's being done. You know, like it needs to get messy for it to get real. And I personally, I don't know about you, but I've wrestled, I've gone back and forth with that. Um, because there have been moments where I've just been like, fuck this. You know, I'm going to be real angry and aggressive about what I believe, and that's okay. And like like we were just saying, I have every right to do that. You have every right to do that. But then I have this tug of war with myself where I'm like, well, how effective is that? What, what, what are is my that really going to be productive? Like, yeah. no, what's I the understand. outcome of this? Like, it's a constant com- tug of war. Yeah, I completely understand that. Yeah. I completely understand that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um. So yeah, back on track here. Okay. <laughs> I've made it through one point so far. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So let's, let's go to, to people of color and maybe some funky reasons that they can, can be in interracial relationships. Um, so, you know, we, we, we mentioned before this racial hierarchy in the U.S., right, where, where that's been set up, where yeah. whites are at the top and the, the darker you are, the closer to the bottom you get. And so I think sometimes for people of color, there can be this idea of like, this is how I'm going to make my life better, right, by marrying someone who's further up the, the food chain, so to speak, right, or further up this racial hierarchy or – Maybe life's been shit for me because of racism, so I'm going to marry a white person to, you know, maybe life will be easier for my kids because mm-hmm. they'll be, have a lighter complexion. You know, we've talked about that before, like the the whole, like, you know, when you mentioned your mom telling you to look out for your brother because he was darker skinned right. than, than you are. And so I think sometimes those, um, you know, things can be motivating factors Um, I think there's also like, we have to look at the history of this country and the narratives that have been set up where, um, you know, in the, in the system of white supremacy, um, white women, so, so white men have held the power right in this country for hundreds of years. And since the beginning of this country as a nation state. Right. And so, um, the narrative that they created was that the ultimate in, um, femininity and the ultimate in like desirability as far as women was white women, right? That they were white women are the standard of beauty and right. This is what the whole, um, a lot of what the KKK was founded on, right. That we're protecting like the purity of whiteness and the purity of white womanhood, right. Against Against these like black men who yeah. are, you know, just these hypersexual beings and rapists and criminals that are just trying to rape our women and right. So that whole narrative. And Go ahead. You, you yeah, just thought. a quick point for anybody who wants to debate that or dispute that. You Google right now, beautiful <laughs> woman, and see what pops up. Right to this day. Right. Or, or just start noticing in movies or like I brought this up recently, right. When we were talking about me watching the bachelorette where there was a black woman who was the object of desire and me realizing like how few times I see that in media and in movies, who is always like 
are almost always the the desire, the object of desire. It's a white woman, mm-hmm. right? Or a white man. Um, and so, yeah, these messages are reinforced in all of these different ways. And so I think that whole historical narrative and what's still being perpetuated today, um, you know, has created in some folks, um, some people of color, right? This idea that if they can be with a white woman or a white man, then that somehow affirms their value as a person of color mm-hmm. or, um, you know, that that's like the ultimate prize. I, I just listened to, um, another podcast that's focused on like Asian American experiences. And they were talking about this, there's this thing among like Asian men where if they're dating a white woman, it's like their Asian friends will be like, bro, you know, like high five, like you got a white woman, you know, like that kind of thing. What? And yeah. And so, and I think, um, yeah, it, it's this whole narrative that, that, oh. okay. It's crazy. You just said that. Um, I will obviously not use the person's name. Um, <laughs> but okay. Um, an old friend of mine, um, who, uh, black guy, um, married to a white woman and, um, hadn't talked to him for some time. Um, found out that I was married to a white woman. Right. Says to me, I can't remember what his exact words were, but it was something to the effect you got one. See? And I was like, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. Right? No. That's exactly what we're talking about. I'm like, no, man. Uh, not, nope. Not, no, 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 no. Right. Not doing what you did. Right. It's because of you I have problems. <laughs> right. You're the guy <laughs> that right. makes my life more difficult because I happen to fall in love with a woman who happened to be white. Right. And so I but constantly fight are- that judging that this certain thing happened, that there was a certain motivation yeah. on your part or hers. Yeah. 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 So, um, but that is, and, and again, right. We're not saying this is all people of color, right. But, but, but these things, because of the racial history and racial present of this country, like sometimes people are operating out of, out of these, um, uh, intentions or I, I can't think of the word like motives or yeah. Um, any other thoughts on yeah, that so I, far? I'm, and I'm really want to tell on myself here, but I, I, I want to be, there's, I don't think there's no point in me having these experiences if I'm not sharing them with other people. Cause I don't like yeah, yeah, yeah. bullshitting in high school. Um, I went to, um, it was a predominantly white high school, but I think it was pretty well balanced. Like it was probably, I don't know, like 30% black, um, 70% white. And, uh, but a lot of us black, black people, we hung out together and I had a close group of, um, uh, black friends and it was maybe like three or four of us. And we had this saying in high school and, um, I'm ashamed of it, but it, it happened. Yeah. And our, this saying we had when we dated women, guess what it was? I don't know. The saying was, if they aren't light or white, they ain't right. Yeah. And we 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 dated by that. And um, it was something that we said. And when I'm like 15, 16, 17 years old, and you know, I don't know. Right. I'm a kid. I don't know shit. Right. And um, but funny thing about that is I actually had a really good friend that was a really dark black girl. And um, so I obviously didn't live to that standard, but I I perpetuated it and I supported it and I joked and laughed with my friends about it and that's really fucked up but it's something that we did and it's that's that's crazy I just now thought about that when you mentioned that that topic yeah and it's like this is exactly what you know what I'm talking about and I think some people grow out of that right That, that maybe you're fed these narratives um like what you're talking about these sayings or these um you know, through media, whatever it is. But I think some people, you know, get to the point where they recognize that and recognize how problematic that is and start to like dig into why they think the way they think and others don't. And they continue to operate out of that. And I think that's like, 
and we'll probably get to this a little more later, but when you asked me on the last episode, like, can't people just have a type, you know, or, or can people just have a type? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, but right. And I think this is what we're getting at. Like, yes, to some extent, I think people can just have a certain type, but are they even aware of what's playing into why they have that type? Mm -hmm. Right. Like in the instance you're talking about as these like teenagers, it's like, okay, so like, your group of friends had maybe had a type like light or white or whatever, but were you aware of all the factors playing into why you find light or white desirable? Yeah. And the right? thing about that was, I don't even know. Well, I be I'm going to speak for myself. I personally didn't believe that because I dated outside of that spectrum. Right. But I, but I, I don't know, but I perpetuated that. Right. And, and some I people can't do. tell you why I did that. Right. Well, and yeah. And so, but I think some people really do buy into that. Like there's different levels, right. Of how deeply people might buy into these narratives or internalize these narratives. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that's like a perfect example of, of what we're talking about. And like I said, it's not just, you know, it's not just black folks. It's like, this whole podcast about Asian men, um, you know, feeling that way. And then there's also a thing of like Asian women being with white men. And so that's like a thing too. So yeah, I think, um, different levels to how much people internalize that and are acting on that. Or like I said, conversely start to recognize that some of these funky things might be driving who, they pursue or who they want to be with. Yeah. I, I just don't know. Now that I'm thinking more deeply about it, I haven't thought a lot about that is I don't know why we said that. <laughs> well, but I mean, if I mean, I know right all in, that stuff plays into it. Like, I guess we're, but, you've been to Columbus, Ohio, so it's predominantly white people. Um, well, it's white, it's white supremacy. It's white supremacy. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, that, that's really it. I was just thinking to myself, because I haven't thought hard about that other than that's just something we said. But I'm like, why do we say that? Because I don't even know that we completely believe that because right. I've even seen one of the other guys date a darker woman, but we we dated white women. We dated light-skinned women. We dated we did all of it. Um, But we had that scene, and we kind of stuck to it to some degree. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it. Where does that come from? Of course. What, what is the answer always? <laughs> White <laughs> supremacy. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, truly. Um, and that's what I was getting at earlier, right? Where white men held the power and held the power to set the narrative. And the narrative is white is best. Right. And that, mm -hmm. that applies in that applied in every area of life, including intimacy and, and, you know, sexual relationships, right? Um, that, that white men and white, well, white men really had the power to do whatever they wanted, right? We've talked about this before, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you want to have sex with someone, you know, it's like, you had the power. So they went out and they raped black women, Right. Or it's like they held enough power, institutional power uh, to be able to do these things, have sexual access to to. And I'm just speaking in general. Right. To who to whomever they wanted to have sexual access to and to be able to get away with that. Right. Like back in the day, like how many white men were ever like, uh, like convicted of raping black women? Like right. probably few to none. Right. They had the power. I mean, it's kind of still that way today. Right? That hasn't completely gone away by any means. No, not at all. Um, and then so so if they're going to set up them. So they held the power to do whatever they want, wanted. And then they they set up the narrative of white women as the ideal of womanhood and of wife, you know, the ideal wife. So then everybody else had to be inferior to that. Right. If you're going to prop up this narrative of white folks being the ideal, you know, partners or being better than everyone else, then everyone else, there have to be lies and narratives um, about everyone else. Right. And so we already talked about 
you know, with black men, they were hyper hypersexualized and criminalized, right? As rapists and just can't control them, like animalistic in their sexuality. Um, and, you know, and that justified, it, it kind of propped up that narrative of like, why white women wouldn't want to be with black men or be in relationship with them. Right. Right. Because they're criminal and they're this and they're that. And also justified lynching them. So it was like these multiple purposes. I think that's probably, I mean, this is not my area of like specialties. I don't know for sure, but I think that's probably why, you know, black women were, are also like the myth about black women is also very hyper sexualized. Right. And I think that was probably to justify um, raping them, right? Like white women were like pure and delicate and they needed to be protected and guarded. Right. But black women were, you know, just again, kind of like seen as these just animalistic in their sexual desire. And so like, I, I can't help it that I raped them or, or they wanted it, you know, or, Mm -hmm. so I think that was, you know, probably the narrative there. And then you have, um, Asian, are you familiar with like the whole like emasculation, like the desexualization of of Asian men? Yeah. Um, All I could say, what I know about that is is this: is that any movie I've seen with an Asian man as the lead, and that's going to be like Jackie Chan or um, uh, I forget the guy who was in um, Jet Li, uh, Romeo Must Die. They never get the girl. They never get the girl, right? They're never seen as like this, like romantic interest or in this. Yeah, because I think it's like, Romeo Must Die, where it was Aaliyah and Jet Li, and in any other movie, those two would have became ended up together <laughs> in the at the end of the movie, right? But they didn't; they were just friends, right? And you're like, wait, what? I was like, wait, what? They're supposed to get. The- I'm <laughs> yeah, watching it, thinking plot, this right. was a get together. I'm like, why didn't they get together? That was weird, right? <laughs> And so, like, tracing that historically, um, and again, this is just me kind of, like, putting some pieces together, but so, like, Asian men started migrating in large numbers around the time of, like, the gold rush, right, on the West Coast, and the men were allowed to migrate, but but they weren't, I don't, I don't think Asian women were allowed to migrate or maybe the men didn't bring their wives because the conditions were going to be so harsh and the you know, the labor was very like horrible conditions. And so I, you know, I think that's probably one of the reasons why that narrative of Asian men, you know, cause there's like the whole idea that like Asian men have small genitalia. Right. So all these ways that Asian men are emasculated and desexualized. But I, again, I think that's another, where does that come from? It comes from white supremacy See. and not wanting Asian men, right, all these Asian men that were on the West Coast to be partnering with white women, right? Because white women were seen by white men as being their property, right? White women are our women. White women are our property. And we don't want these other men taking our property. Go ahead. Um, all, I guess all I'm saying or thinking to myself is like, it goes back to that thing I said about being a teenager and saying, you know, if they're not light or white, they ain't right. We all, it's like all these little jokes and things that are normal in society. It, it's, it's, it's astounding to me looking back on that, thinking about how fucked up it was. Right. Um, because there were, we had, I can remember probably making jokes about Asian men having small genitals. Like, right. I've, I've, I think common. I've done that. Right, but well, but again, it's I'm thinking it's just wild to me in my head. I'm like, why do we even do that? Like, where did that come from? Like, we didn't. Be- it was just something we perpetuated. Or where did you learn that? Where did I learn that? Right, because these aren't. Th- I was thinking about this in this whole like sexual stereotypes thing. Like these aren't things that are. It's more like passed down. You know, like. I, Maybe you hear it in movies occasionally. You do, I guess. But how are these these myths and these narratives passed around? And I think it's like jokes and like 
pr- more like private conversations where these things are perpetuated. Yeah, because I can probably swear to you, I've probably used that as a grotesque pickup line <laughs> as a as a teenager. Like, um, I because this va- this this comes to my mind vaguely where I, I I probably said something to the effect where this girl was wanting to date this Asian guy, and I was like, well, you know, you don't want to date him because you know. <laughs> Right. And me, I'm black, so, you know, I'm packing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know? Yeah. It's sick. (laughs) Yeah. And it it contributes to – actually, I was just thinking about that today, too, about – not that – I think I've maybe had this happen once. It hasn't been that frequent. But, yeah, we're, like, black men use that as kind of like a pickup line. Yeah. You know, like, like, well, hey, like – have you ever had this before? You know, black, <laughs> this. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, really, are you really wanting to, um, sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with my words, but like, are you really wanting t- that to be how people see you or that to be the reason why someone is with you? I mean, I know when you're like, young or even when you're not young like some guys don't care like wh- whatever no. but i think really do you want like if you're thinking in a long-term like healthy relationship kind of way not in a just like getting what you can get kind of way it's like is that really how you want someone to look at you in this very like like racially sexualized way and are you really aware of like the history of all this shit and where this comes from and how it was used. And most people aren't right. Like the majority of people are not aware of the history and not aware of what they're perpetuating, even when they think they're using these stereotypes to their advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because that's, that's screwed up because you could see a black guy. I can see a black guy doing that where they're, they're wanting to use that stereotype to pick up a woman, but turn around and be like, but police brutality. Right. I'm like, yo, I'm like, you can't, you got, no, you can't have it both ways, man. Well, and just realizing that that very thing, like about black men's genitalia or the hypersexualization of black men being what justified so many black people getting lynched. Like, is that really what you, like, maybe that's not exactly what's happening today. (laughs) Right? I know. I know. That is, that, that is, <laughs> you find me a black guy who thinks like that, I will give you all the money I have. Because <laughs> those, those connections, like, we're not, I'm not, I mean, not even me, like, that requires some thought. I mean, it's there, but you just have to think about it. Like, sure. the same thing you're perpetuating in this arena can get you killed. Right. Right. Because black men will talk. But see, black men are aware of white women accusing, falsely accusing black men of rape historically. Right. I know a lot of black men that are aware of that. And so when a a situation comes up today, that is that like a white woman accusing a black man of rape. It's like, oh, people are aware of that history. But haven't gone deep enough with it. Right with their with their with their understanding, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, like I, I we have to own that. You know that we have to, we have to take responsibility for that kind of yeah. Yeah. So um, okay. So we were talking about Asian men being emasculated. Yeah. Um, and, and I think generally, just kind of what I'm trying to say about all this is. All of these things have in common. What what all these things have in common is white men shaping these narratives and kind of policing um, the gates of sexual access or sexual desirability. And I mean, we see this nowhere more clearly than like anti-miscegenation laws, right? Which were laws that were in effect in this country until the late sixties, right? Like in our laws that like legally people of color were not allowed to be with white folks, Mm -hmm. right? That's how pristine and pure and above everyone else. White folks were that, that they could not, you know, be partnered with or marry or be in relationship with people of color. That's how gross and inferior people of color were, which 
like we've talked about, we know that in reality, that's not actually what was happening. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We've talked about white men raping black women and, you know, like, like policing those relationships was harder in reality, right. Then, but, but that was the law. And so um, I think to justify those laws, all these narratives had to be created around people of color and why they were inferior and why they shouldn't be partnered with. And the thing is, you know, even though those laws were, were abolished in the late sixties, I think it was when the, the last of those laws were abolished. Um, it's like those narratives have not gone away. That's what we've been talking about this whole conversation, right? right? The narratives around, um, people of color and, and why they, 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 or who they are sexually or who they are in their desirability, those things have not gone away. And we see that in, um, you know, there's a lot of like online, you know, with, with how popular online dating apps are these days, you know, people study that people study, um, who gets the most likes or who gets the most messages or, and it's very racialized. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but, um, the studies I've read show that like Asian women get often get the most messages and the most likes, which we haven't talked about. Well, we haven't talked about Asian women in this podcast. We've talked about that a little bit, I think last time, Mm -hmm. but um, you know, Asian women uh, back in the early 1900s had a very negative stereotype, you know, that they were dirty and they were all prostitutes and they all had like, you know, diseases and like STIs and, uh, but then somewhere along the way that change. And I think it was when, um, white, um, it was with all the war, the wars in Asia where, where we had servicemen stationed in Vietnam and in, um, Korea and all, all Japan, all these different countries and white men now were wanting to partner with Asian women. So guess, guess what narrative changes, right? right. So now um, actually, and this is like, I think so interesting. Um, there were all these laws um, specifically limiting Asian migration to the States, like the Chinese exclusion act, all these laws, um, limiting Chinese migration to this very small quota. I think it was like 105 Asian people per year could migrate to the States that like, so that's like almost no one, right? Like a very small number, but there were um, laws like exceptions made to that quota Mm -hmm. to allow for like the Asian wives of servicemen to migrate. So they were excluded from that quota. So again, and of course there were, it wasn't just white men who were partnering with Asian women during like, as a result of those wars, there were some black men too, but it was primarily white men. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's like, again, we see, Oh, what white men want. Let's just change the laws, right? Let's change the narrative of Asian women being diseased and prostitutes and this and that. And now there, there's actually like propaganda, like I've seen some of this, of like different billboards or advertisements, like showing these happy like servicemen with their Asian wives and like propagating this narrative of um, this whole like region that we've excluded and we've demonized, right? Asia. Yeah. And we don't want these people here. That was the common narrative of the day. And there's all kinds of like, um, posters and and propaganda that that you can still see today. That's like demonizing Asian migrants is like stealing all of white people's jobs, and um, it's that whole yellow peril. I don't know if you've heard of that, but there was this whole narrative about how dangerous, you know, quote unquote, yellow people were for all these different reasons, and they ate rats, and they did this, and they did that. And so oh we don't want yeah, them the, here. the the another one of the things you hear growing up is you know Asian food. Or Chinese food is uh, might have was it dog meat or cat meat or yeah, something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all those jokes. Right, exactly. So there were all these narratives about like justifying excluding Asian folks from migrating, but then when white men 
want to be with Asian women, we, they just create another a new law like that allow that a new a new narrative that that posits like Asian women as wonderful wives and desirable. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like whatever white men want. <laughs> They just make laws to allow for that. And so anyways, but back to what I was saying about the online dating statistics. So, yeah, so Asian women getting the majority, you know, like the most um, positive feedback. And then guess who is in the the bottom of that? Like who's not getting <laughs> the attention and the likes? Yeah. Um, it's black women. Right. Because of this narrative of of black women being, you know. Like if white women are like the, per, you know, the best wife material, quote unquote, then black women have been been the narrative of them is that they're at the opposite end of that. Right. That they're they're too much to handle or they're not like submissive enough, quote unquote, mm-hmm. or, you know, all the narratives around black women or black is not beautiful. Right. Like mm-hmm. the the darker kind of the opposite of that, that phrase you brought up. Like if white or light is the best, then what does that make the worst? Well, dark skin. Right. Um, and then on the man, the male side of things, these stats show that like Asian men get the least, you know, like, um, yeah, the least on the man's, the male side of things with, in these dating apps. And so, and again, we've already talked about like the reasons behind that. So it's like, you know, people aren't aware that these historical narratives, these things that these narratives that were started hundreds of years ago are still playing out today in who's seen as desirable and who is seen as undesirable or who is seen as, um, you know, worthy of being a wife or a husband and who's not or who's seen, seen as like sexually, you know, potent and who's not. And so... um Again, like that whole thing of like, can people have a type? Well, yes, but but what formed, what shaped your idea of who the ideal type is? And I think a lot of times it's a lot of these very problematic things that, like we said, people aren't even aware of, um, you know, or maybe they're vaguely aware of it, but they're mostly operating out of it in a very um, subconscious way. Um, and I think something... Um, I, I mean, things that certainly throw up like ginormous red flags are, you know, people who say, uh, well, I mean, I think especially if white folks are like, well, I date, I only date white people, <laughs> right? Like that is a yeah, it's pretty major, blatant. like, you're, <laughs> well, you're, you're probably racist. <laughs> like, sorry, no, no, I'm not. I just, I just so like white guys. guys. Or white women. No. No, no, <laughs> no, fam, no. <laughs> right. Or if someone says, someone does date interracially, but they say, you know, I have a thing for, you know, like Asian women or I have a thing for black men. And knowing, like, if you're aware of the narrative around black men or Asian women, the, the sexual stereotypes and all of that, right? Then it's like, mm, okay, but is this coming out of believing some of these stereotypes? Um, You know, and again, I think a a lot of times people are just operating out of these things and not really realizing. And um, yeah, so I think certainly anytime somebody tells me I only date intraracially or I date interracially and have a thing for (laughs) these type of people, I'm just like, that's definitely something I'm going to want to flesh out a little bit. Like I'm going to want to ask you some questions. I mean, if you're somebody close to me, if you're not, then I'm just like, whatever, but uh, you know, and kind of see what's underneath this. And I do think sometimes, um, you know, you might have a white person who grew up in a primarily black neighborhood or in a primarily black school. And so, you know, like culturally you understand why they would be, attracted to, you know, dating black folks, right? Because that's a, a culture that they're very familiar with and mm-hmm. that they grew up in, you know? So again, I'm not making blanket statements, but um, I think given the history of this country, um, 
and all of these different narratives and stereotypes and, and different racial dynamics, you know, I think people like to think, oh, love is love. And you just like, I just fell for who I fell for. And I'm not saying that can never happen, but I think more often than not, there are these kind of things playing in the background or motivating people that they may not be aware of. And when I say these things, I mean like everything we've talked about in this podcast. <laughs> right. Um, and I even <clears throat> had this come up, like I had this come up really recently with some really close person in my family. Again, I'm not going to name names, but was talking about how, you know, they're dating this white person and this white person was kind of like putting, they felt pressured, but so it's this person in my family is a person of color. Right. And they felt pressured by their, their significant other in this certain area to kind of like get their shit together. And they were upset about that and started talking about, you know, maybe I should, you know, like I'm not into, I've never been attracted to Asian women. I've always been attracted to white women, but maybe I should have, maybe I should have dated a white uh, or an Asian woman. Cause then maybe she wouldn't be like pressuring me like this. And I was like, Oh, G. like mm -hmm. what, you know, I just heard like, what am I hearing right now? You know, it, it, it's, and it's that, you know, stereotype of Asian women being like submissive and being docile. And, and, you know, I ended up having a long conversation with this person basically said like, you're operating, you're, you, you have all these stereotypes of women. And this person was like, no, 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 I don't have any stereotypes. And I'm like, no, you literally just had a bunch of stereotypes that came out of your mouth. So yes, you do. <laughs> like, and, you know, and, and just like try to challenge that way of thinking. I was like, I'm an Asian woman. Am I docile? Like, am I submissive? Like, am I, you know, mm -hmm. non-assertive? Okay, then like what? And he agreed that, that no, I am assertive and I am, you know, outspoken. And so I was like, okay, then like, why are you stereotyping Asian women to be this certain way then? And just assuming that they would would have this certain demeanor. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things we could unpack from. Well, yeah, I was, I was thinking that <laughs> when, when you, whatever the conversation is, but that type of situation, when you put it back on them and their immediate responses, you know, like, no, 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 no. It's, it's almost like you just dropped a ton of bricks on them. You know, <laughs> if they get it, um, or if it has any impact on them. And I feel like it's, it's a it's a lot for them to deal with in that moment. So like you said, right. it takes some time for them to chew on it. and huh. Especially when they're at that level of understanding, right? Because this person also expressed just blatant stereotypes about black women, mm -hmm. having an attitude and this and that and the other. I mean, every like, group of women that this person brought up was all based on stereotypes like heavily, like yeah. the most common stereotypes. And it's like, and even the whole idea of, well, why are you, you know, like the whole idea of, but I'm not attracted to Asian women. I'm attracted to white women again. I mean, this is kind of like proving my point. Well, why are you attracted to white women? You think it's just, you know, he thinks that's just his type, but then he talks about all these stereotypes of all these other women. Right. So obviously it's, you're not attracted to these other women to dating these other women because you see them in these very negative ways or as far as Asian women, now you're considering dating or maybe you should have dated Asian, an Asian woman because you're seeing them in this very stereotyped way as well. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just like this total lack of awareness around how they're seeing women and and who they're seeing as dateable or pursuable but it's all based on these ignorant you know stereotypes and um yeah so just kind of another example of how these things play out in everyday life yeah i would when love... pe and go ahead go ahead well and like i said i i don't know that he'd ever thought through all these things probably hadn't because in his mind, the stereotypes are true. 
Right. He's just stating fact. Well, black women are this way and Asian women are this way. So, like, what do you mean stereotypes? This is just the truth. I'm like, no, they're stereotypes. Right, right. And, you know, and we had a long conversation about that. And we had a long conversation about why he even feels the need. Like, why does he as a man want to be with a woman who is docile and this and that and how that comes out of a lot of sexism. And I mean, yeah, he got hit with a ton. But, <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to, like cater it to where he where i know that he is yeah. in his journey but i also didn't want to hold back either you know i try to break it down for him but he needs to chew on these things and it's probably not gonna change his dating you know like he, he's been in, entrenched in this way of thinking for long enough that that that's probably not gonna change anytime soon and by that <laughs> time he'll probably have made Married someone, married a white woman. You know what I'm saying? So I think even for some people, by the time I know this happens, actually, this happens a lot. Like I have people tell me this is kind of crazy <laughs> talking about things people don't talk about in mm -hmm. public. You know, I have people of color every so often express to me, I didn't realize what was motivating me as a, you know, back in the day. And I, I married a white person. Like I didn't realize what I was getting into or I, you know, they went ahead and made these like life decisions, these huge life decisions, right. Based on their knowledge at the time, which wasn't, or their awareness at the time, which wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. And then later in life, you know, they, they, they start to realize what was motivating them and they start to realize maybe these funky things that, that motivated their decisions, but now they're already two or three kids in and, you know, 15 years into this relationship. And so, you know, that that's, that's just where they are and that's where they choose to stay. Um, I think for many, for many people. Right. And you know, when life is like that, like we don't, we're making decisions as we go along. Like we, it's not like we, we reach some point of arrival and then we start making big life decisions, right? Whether it's in this area or other areas, right? We're just making, you know, like what, what thing we decide to major in, what degree, well, we don't, we're just making the best decision we have at the time. And in hindsight, right. Knowing what we know now, maybe we would have made a different decision or maybe things would have played out differently. So I get that that happens in, you know, it happens in relationships too, but I think those are sometimes some of the, um, I don't want to say secretive conversations, but kind of, you know, some conversations that happen behind closed doors occasionally where people are realizing um, some of those things that motivated them, but they're kind of already, you know, they've already made a, a lifelong commitment. And so yeah. I don't know. Thoughts? <clears throat> Yeah, I was going to say, um, not that it's about this, but I was thinking to myself, I, I would love to conduct an experiment, you know, with, with men or women that say they're not attracted to a certain race. Like you were saying, I only date white women or I only date white men or whatever it is. I would love to conduct the experiment and, and, and prove that wrong, meaning like, I bet you, bet you a million bucks I could find a black woman you're attracted to, you know, or an Asian woman, um, because I think like with racism and this is just me speaking, this is my opinion. Um, I think it's learned obviously. Um, because like I always like to look at kids and you'll see kids playing together, you know, at a daycare or whatever. And they're not thinking about race or anything. They're just playing and having fun. And then as they get older, based on who their parents are, they start to learn whatever it is they're going to learn about society and race. And then, because that, that happened to me, like I, I had white friends that as we got older, started to pull away and started to act weird and like, hey, Matt, you going to do some of that hip hop for us? You know, right. I was like, what? <laughs> like, where did that come from? Sure. Um, so I guess I was just saying on that to say, you know, a, a lot of this stuff is obviously learned and it's like we were saying, it's kind of, it's just all throughout society in all levels and all shapes and forms. It's jokes, it's stereotypes, it's, it's movies, it's music. It's, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> right. You know? 
Yeah. And I mean, this, this conversation I'm talking about with this relative of mine, you know, this person has no close relationships with, with Asian folks or black folks, not just women, but just in general. And so I'm like, well, you don't even know. I mean, and that's, I guess, part of why the, the stereotypes are so deep for this person. That's all they know. They don't actually have real relationships with, you know, with folks to know that these stereotypes uh, are not true. Um, and so, yeah, maybe if this person, you know, had a wider range of, of friends and didn't live in this white bubble, um, you know, yeah, that, that maybe some of those dating, you know, quote unquote preferences, <laughs> I'll use that loosely, you know, would be different. But I also think sometimes, you know, conversely, sometimes people have surface level interaction or even deep interaction with other folks. And instead of that serving to debunk those stereotypes, you know, it might just confirm, you know, there's that whole thing of like confirmation bias where people already believe a certain thing in their head and then they take in information in a certain way that just confirms those biases. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think exposure or being around people of, of these different, you know, racial groups doesn't always necessarily uh, work to debunk <laughs> racism or stereotypes either. But I think it, for many people, it can, right? Like you start to have relationships and start to see um, like, oh, here's the, these black women that are, uh, you know, super chill and, and have a more passive personality. And here's these Asian women that have these more like fiery personalities and, and, you know, like you just start to see that like in every group, like people are people and you're going to, it's going to run the gamut as far as personality types and this sort of thing. And you start to see that those stereotypes are just stereotypes. But I think a lot of times people just live in those bubbles or they have, like I said, the surface level interaction. And so, um, or they do what we talked about earlier. Well, you're not like everyone else, yeah. right? The, the stereotypes start to get debunked. And then instead of l like having a light bulb moment where it's like, Oh, Matt's not like this or that. So my stereotypes about black men or black people must be wrong. Instead of that, it's just like, Oh, you're not like all the rest of them. All the rest of them are still that way, but you're not, right. you know, you're the exception. And so, um, I don't know. It, yeah. It, I don't know what. Yeah. I'm yeah. Saying, I was go going to ask you, like, can you give us a final thought? And the final thought I was having is what you just said <laughs> was basically at the end of the day, um, to kind of wrap this up neat with a bow. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not neat. <laughs> people are people, no matter what race you are. And that's kind of, I guess if there's any lesson to be learned from this conversation is in my opinion, that, and like you like you were saying, once you get to know the people, the stereotypes begin to get debunked, and it starts breaking yeah. down. And you're like, oh, you're just an actual individual with certain personality traits, right? Or you might see some of those. You know, I think there are some stereotypes, or maybe even a lot of stereotypes that have maybe a tiny grain of truth in them. Not all, no. But some um, might. The sad thing about that is. Have you ever heard like the saying, there's some truth in stereotypes? Yeah. So I think even if you do see some of the, the stereotypes um, being true or having a grain of truth, I think, you know, my goal is always to, to understand where those come from. And there, you know, a lot of times it's, it's, it's come out of cultural expectations you know like there is a lot of pressure on asian women culturally to uh well culturally and from sexism and patriarchy which is also just as worldwide as white supremacy right to be um this certain type of way you know to be submissive or to be obedient to your parents or your husband or all these different things and so i don't know i think that's my whole my whole thing is just understanding where certain things come from so that then you can make an informed decision about 
who you want to be and how you want to live your life and what beliefs you want to hold. Because if you don't know, if you don't understand something and you don't understand where it's coming from, you know, you're just operating out of that lack of awareness. And so I think that's, that's my, I wouldn't say my whole life goal. I have lots of goals in life, but right. Just that's why I'm so interested in understanding culture, people's cultures and learning about different cultures is because the more I learn about my own culture, other people's cultures, the more I can see the big picture and make more informed decisions, you know, about who I want to be. And, you know, like we were talking about earlier, we perpetuate things, not even realizing that we're perpetuating these very harmful things. And so the more, you know, I can be aware of that, the more I can, um, you know, just make a conscious choice about what I want to perpetuate. And it's always a learning process. Like we're, we're, you know, we're not going to arrive. Like it's, we're going to, you know, I'm going to be on this journey till the day I die, like learning to better understand different groups and different communities. Mm -hmm. And, and that extends obviously beyond race, you know, it's gender, it's sexuality, it's ability, it's, um, you know, lots of different areas and, you know, there's a lot to, to understand, but I, I don't know. It's something I find, um, necessary, I guess, but also I, I enjoy being able to understand where people are coming from because then I can relate to that person on that much of a deeper level and not misunderstand who they are. You know what I'm saying? Like we kind of talked about with my mom, you know, I think it's a natural human tendency when you don't understand someone or something to label that in a negative way as weird or wrong or bad or, and so I think the more I can understand people from different backgrounds, you know, the more I can be better at not labeling them as um, in negative ways, but rather, you know, understanding who they are and where they're coming from and why they are the way they are. Or I don't know. It, it, it just, I love being able to relate to people on a deep level and to relate to people on a deep level. You need to under, be able to understand, you know what I'm saying? Where they're coming from and be able to believe them when they tell you this is my life experience. And so I think the more I can do that, the more I can get to know people from all different walks of life. And I just love, I love doing that. And so I think that's part of what motivates me. You know, I want to be able to relate to to people, all kinds of people in healthy, non-harmful ways. And to be able to do that, I have to educate myself, (laughs) right. And have to listen and learn. So yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to make that all about me and my motivations, but. um, No, I I think that was, um, Uh, real important. I was I was listening to you and just letting you kind of go through that that spiel there. Um, I think that was really relevant, and I think that was very important. You just said what you just said, and um, I, I hope that people can listen and relate to that and begin to have a deep understanding about life and how to relate to people. Um, and I I subscribe to that um, to some degree. I, I try not to uh, dig too deep with a lot of people because you're, you're unfortunately disappointed a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I got my close group of family and friends near me and, um, I need to be better at that. So not to keep rambling on about that. Well, I don't even want to say we're rambling. We are making very, I think important and relevant points. Um, but I, I think that's a good stopping point. There are other things I want to get into. Um, did you have more? <laughs> Are we going to do um, a part four? Because I don't think, I still don't think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can talk about that. Um, I got through most of what I wanted to talk about. I mean, there's a few loose ends, but I got through the majority, but yeah, we can definitely chat about where we want to head Okay. next time. So. All right. Yeah. Cause I took a few notes here and I did want us to veer off into these other points. I wanted to kind of finish that point. Okay. Uh, other points you were making. So <laughs> Okay. I was responsible. <laughs> you were responsible. <laughs> I'm not gonna go down that one or that rabbit hole right now. Um so yeah. 
Um, so yeah, thanks again uh, for listening. We're I, it's okay. I think we're at an hour and a half. Um, I don't think that's horrible. We're usually around an hour and twenty minutes. Okay. Um, but again, I think these are really uh, you know meaningful episodes and conversations that we are having, and I don't think it's fast food. So yeah, you know, if you're consuming this, <clears throat> hopefully it's working for you and the full episode or if you listen to it in increments um you know we'll do our best to not let it go on to two hours <laughs> <laughs> that's all we can promise huh <laughs> yeah i think I'll, I'll cap it at an hour and a half and we'll try to keep it around their hour to an hour and a half okay okay Sounds so like a plan thanks again well, thanks as always and um yeah we'll chat again soon okay talk to you soon okay take care all right mm-hmm. bye, bye. So there we go. We got part three of racial fetishes. I think there will be a part four. And um, I, I do think we are kind of really digging deep into this topic because I, I think it is important, like I was just saying. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and send us off here with another playlist shuffle uh, on the uh, playlist. For those of you who are big, it's like a like a radio host. Those of you that are big R and B fans, you may remember this jam back from the '90s. Lucy Pearl, dance tonight. <laughs>